Sean, the belief that the universe is far larger than we can see in, in our observable light cone has introduced certain problems of predictability into cosmological understanding. Walk me through how that works. Well, the, the phrase super large universe, some people say very large universe, <laughs> or I just say, you know, really big universe. And so what is that supposed to mean? The universe is obviously really big. What we're talking about is a universe that is so big, what I'm talking about, so big that the, the room in which we find ourselves right here, including you and me and the molecules we're made up and so forth, appears more than once in the universe. Maybe an infinite number of times, maybe plenty, plenty of times. There are many, many observers in the universe. Conditions that we're familiar with recur over and over again. And that raises... Now, why would that be the case? Because if the universe was so big and you have the number of particles we have, there can only be certain numbers of combinations that would occur. And if you have an infinite universe, those combinations of the numbers of particles in the known universe are going to repeat themselves at some point if you have infinity. That's right. That's one way to get a really large universe. There's actually many different ways. There's sort of the cosmological multiverse. There's just really big universes that go on forever. There's also, in time, you could sort of have a cyclic universe where things right. repeat over and over again. And so in that sense of really largeness, where you and I recur over and over, there's a new kind of uncertainty that enters physics because I can know everything about the universe and still not know which example of me I am. So the kind of uncertainty like, well, what do I expect to see when I look at the sky might be different if the universe is very large or if it's just singular. Uh, and the very large nature of the universe is, would cause that it's not just us in this current position, but we would be in every little tiny variant from, from this. I mean, one, your watch would be blue, everything else would be exactly the same. Or an angle would be 72 degrees instead of 71 degrees uh, to your wrist. I mean, we're talking about a, a huge, infinite number of, of infinities compounded. That's right, and, but we don't know, you know whether or not this happens. So I, I want to reassure people that this right. is not a strong prediction of a theory that we actually believe. It's a possibility we're taking seriously. And the first worry you have is that if that were true, there would be, for every one me, there'd be, like you say, many, many large numbers of people who are close to me but worse in some way. Their knowledge of the universe is not as good or things are more surprising to them or, you know, uh, random things happen because everything happens, right? So I think there's actually good reason, based on arguments like that, to not believe in the simplest kind mm -hmm. of very large universe. I don't think that every random collection of stuff happens with equal probability. Okay, so what's the implication of that? Well, the implication of that is we need to understand cosmology better to know that when people like me occur, if it's more than once, they're always associated with certain thermodynamically sensible evolutions, that, that, that people don't just appear. So Carl Sagan once said, in order to make an apple pie, you must first invent the universe. To make an apple pie, you need apples, you need sugar, therefore you need an apple orchard, you need sugar cane, you need the biosphere, you need the Big Bang. Okay. We want to make a cosmological model in which Sagan was right, that apple pies appear if and only if there's a whole universe appearing to make them. And, and does that way of thinking give you some sense of the, the ontological underpinnings of, of the universe? If, if you have to go through all of that for the universe to really work, I mean, it, it, it's, it seems like that's, that's telling us something. I think the, the fact that we want the universe to make sense is telling us something because our universe does make sense. I think it is, therefore, it gives us a really good handle on possible cosmological models. If your cosmological model is everything that could possibly happen mm -hmm. happens an infinite number of times with equal probability, that's ruled out. Not necessarily by the data, but by the fact that we can't possibly imagine living in a universe like that. So exclude that from your cosmological toolbox. Let's try to do better. And does that, and what does that mean to our sense of reality? I, I mean, now you're excluding certain possibilities. Uh, why? What gives you the right to exclude those possibilities? I think this is a modern cosmological version of ancient skeptical conundrums, right? How do we know that we're not being teased by an evil demon? <laughs> How do we know that we're not dreaming? How do we know that we're not a brain in a vat or living in a simulation? You don't know any of these things in the sort of mathematical certainty, but it can nevertheless be absolutely fruitless to accept them. You should try to build theories that are compatible with everything you know, and when those theories are true, what you know makes sense to you.